director of the International House from 1988 until 2007, and a former Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya, Bill Burry. Bill is a cross cultural communications trainer and teacher who was lecture at Calvin's College in Asia, Africa, and Europe, and at various OSHA institutes. Uh, he's an award winning author of this book. Perception and Deception, a mind-opening journey across country. Mm. And um, he has brought a few of these books for sale. They'll be in the museum afterwards until about 420. Pick up a copy, but they are also available um, on Amazon. So um, uh, so Joe's intercultural work has been featured on NPR, PBS, and the Commonwealth Club, and the World Affairs Council. He remains involved in the IHOS activities and residence to this day. So, Joe will be speaking on the IHOS's role on desegregating Berkeley. A warm welcome to Joe Lurie. all for coming. Uh, some of you may have seen that as you were clapping and welcoming me, I started to clap. And some of you may have thought that was a little bizarre. I my clapping when you're welcoming me. This is part of the cross-cultural procession I've had over the years. When I've worked in many countries in Asia, when you have someone who's being introduced or at the end of an event, you applaud them, thank you, them, praising them, whatever. The person on stage will often do this, saying thank you for welcoming me. So that's the reason I was doing that instinctively. I was in a different cultural narrative at the time. So, um, why this talk, why now? <clears throat> So these, right, the whole story about desegregating Berkeley uh, is a story, of course, that you can imagine that I have told at iHouse over many years. And uh, even after I left iHouse, I began to go deeper and realize that many of its alumni had a big impact, that they took the message of International House to Berkeley beyond and even nationally. And because I noticed at least in my view right now, our society is going through an incredible amount of polarization, toxicity. In some ways, I think that many of our communities are being re-segregated, re-segregated. So I thought at this time, there's an important message about the International House that should be told, perhaps to give glimmers of hope. Um, and so what I'm going to do is to divide this up into three broad areas. One, the institution itself. How did it start? What was its impact here in Berkeley as an institution? I'm going to talk about black alumni uh, who had an extraordinary impact in desegregating the area and beyond nationally, as well as, because of the exhibit here, Chinese alumni. Um, and then, for those of you who may have questions, comments, critiques, uh, whatever you'd like to do at the end of the talk, happy to have that uh, discussion with you. I've also invited a former resident of International House who will speak about her dad. We'll just kind of keep that quiet for the moment, right? Uh, as a kind of a surprise. There are several people here who lived at our house. Raise your hand if you lived at our house. There we go. So they, were, they are here to correct me. Uh, and, uh, so before I start, let me just get a little sense of you. How many of you have never been in the building? Never been in the building? Okay. Um, how many of you, just take a couple of quick, for those of you who've never been in the building, a couple of quick questions and answers. How many of you think, uh, just raise your hand and say, how many people you think live there? Let's see, how many people do you think live at, at IHOUSE? Probably hundreds. Hundreds. How about you, Joe? Two hundred. Two hundred. Wrong. Four hundred. Four hundred. And you live there. Wrong. <laughs> Okay, keep, keep coming. So about right now, it's about 615. Uh, how many countries are represented at IHOUSE? Let's just take a quick look. Yeah. 15. Okay. How many, well, I just know a little bit about it. How many countries do you think? Out of 600 people, how many countries? 70. You're from close to 70. You live in Berkeley. Okay, so that's a bad it's about, in any given year, it could be 75 to 85 countries. 75 to 85 countries. Um, the other thing is, for those of you who know something about the building, 
How many of you did not know that U.S. Americans live at our house? Live at our house. That Americans live at our house. How many of you did not know that? Wow, that is good. Because I would tell you that to this day, I would say over well over 50% of the people on campus, students, and even some faculty do not know that U.S. Americans live at IS. Why do I say U.S. Americans? You know, there are other Americans who don't live in this country. All of Latin America and Central America. Okay. So, how did this start? It started, ironically enough, with a Chinese student in 1909. So the gentleman who had the idea for International House, his name was Harry Edmonds, and he was working for the YMCA in New York City, and he was walking up the steps of Columbia University, and a Chinese student at Columbia was walking up the steps, and Mr. Edmonds said, good morning to the student, uh, this Chinese student, and the Chinese student looked startled, stunned, Mr. Edmonds says, what's wrong? And he said, well, I've been in this country two or three weeks. You are the first person who has spoken to me. <laughs> that was 1909. So in that moment, Harry Edmonds began to develop a dream. And that was, well, there are other people from other countries, from China, from many other countries, who are here in the United States, nothing like today. But still, they must be living in isolation. Maybe we ought to bring them together, help them understand each other, help them understand the United States and all of its diversity, and vice versa, help Americans understand people from other cultures. So, for the next, I guess it was about 10, 15 years, he started to bring people together at his home for something called Sunday Summers, people from different countries. And eventually he approached John D. Rockefeller Jr. and he persuaded John D. Rockefeller Jr. to create the first major international house in the, in the world, actually, the first major one in New York City, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And that in itself, it's up near Columbia, right close, I think it's across the street from Grass Coombe, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves. No, it's near uh, Riverside Church. Riverside Church, but across the street, you missed the tomb. This tomb is at the Okay. All right. <laughs> but I will be doing like this when I go home. All right, so in any case, um, so it was, you know, it was itself kind of a radical thing to do. And actually, there was a plan. Thank you. There was a plan, actually, to have a swimming pool at the International House of New York. And while they thought this was a radical idea to bring all these people together from all over the world for the first time to live together, uh, the idea of a swimming pool, they weren't ready to jump into the water yet and say that people from different ethnicities could actually swim in the same swimming pool. So I've seen the notes on this. I know that it was an idea that they couldn't implement. In essence, that has a whole new lecture at the International House of New York. Because it was a success, because it was a success, uh, Harry Evans then said, well, we've got one on the East Coast, kind of a gateway from the Atlantic. Let's put one on the West Coast, kind of a gateway from the Pacific. Why were At the time, there were something like two or three hundred students from overseas. Can you imagine? Two or three hundred. Today, anybody have an idea of how many students from other countries, the visiting scholars there are at Berkeley right now? How many? 10,000. It's, it's up there. Definitely way between five and 10,000. You, you know, you might be, I think this gentleman is a historian for this thing, right? <laughs> okay. So it's, it's, it's extraordinary to know. But that's the reason why Berkeley was chosen. And yet it was a radical idea. So when they started to talk about uh, having an international house here in Berkeley, you have to remember that Berkeley, a lot of people have pushed back at me when I've said this. It was a segregated community. In many ways, it was like toxic parts of the South at the time. So if you were a person of color, you couldn't even live within two or three miles of the university. There was a Chinese house, a Filipino house, and they were two to three miles away from the university. And unless you were a service person, basically the whole area within two to three miles of the university, unless you were Caucasian, uh, you couldn't live there. And so, even there was redlining against Jews at the time. So this, you know, this is very strange to the ears of people in Berkeley today. Many people in Berkeley today. So, uh, 
when that first idea was proposed to the Berkeley community, there were 800 to 1,000 people who protested its creation. Why? A, property owners, property owners thought that property values would go down. B, there were laws against miscegenation in the state of California until I believe it was 1948. Does that sound about right? Yeah. 1948. So, IHOS was the very first interracial co-educational living center west of New York City in the United States. So, right here, 800 to 1,000 people protested the creation of IHOS in the late 20s, right in front of this building. If you doubt that, look up the history. And what's really interesting, and this comes to the first step towards breaking down these barriers, a black reporter for the Oakland Tribune, whose name was Delilah Beasley, she stood up in front of that crowd, right here, with Alan Blaisdell, who was the very first director of International House, to defend the concept, to defend the concept, because she was talking about what she had learned about people of all backgrounds, and people of color living together at International House in New York. So this was a very courageous thing for her to do, and Alan Blaisdell has written about his, his thanks, his gratitude for Delilah Beasley. And look her up. She's written the books about her. The African American Museum, I believe, in Oakland features her. And if you go into International House, next to the auditorium, there's a whole history. And there's a whole panel about the, the beginning of International House and uh, Delilah Beasley's role in defending the concept and helping to break barriers. <laughs> So, then there was a long discussion about where are we going to put International House? What, what part of Berkeley? Which part of the campus? And so they finally, with Harry Edmonds encouragement, decided to put it on Piedmont Avenue, where of course all the fraternities were segregated. And I'm quoting Harry Edmonds now. He said, let's put Piedmont Avenue and punch bigotry right in the nose. So, Let's show that this can happen. Now, may, how many of you have been in the cafe on Piedmont Avenue? Okay, so many people think that's the dining room. It's not. And it had a strategic purpose. By the way, it was renamed in the last two or three years, Harry Edmonds Cafe. Right, Bob? Bob Wong is a longtime board member of IOC. He will check me discreetly. <laughs> so, so um, okay. So the whole idea of the cafe was, let us quietly, without being threatening, encourage people who don't live here to mingle with the residents of International House in the cafe. Let us humanize them. Now, many of you who went to Cal in the 60s, the 50s, anybody who went to Cal in the 50s and 60s here? Okay. I'm wondering whether you remember that, at least certainly until the 60s, I know this is, I've seen this documented, that the International House was called the zoo. <laughs> it was called the zoo. That term came about early in the 30s. And in those days, believe it or not, tour buses, this is such a phenomenon, that tour buses from San Francisco, tour buses, yes, from San Francisco wanted to come out and look at all these peculiar people, the zoo. And the students at I House, you know, many of them very brilliant, just like at Cal today, not all of them, but certainly many of them, they would come out and when the Tour buses came by, this is what they would do. They'd come out on the grass and do this. <laughs> <laughs> this, is this is documented in Harry and uh, uh, Alan Blaisdell's oral history. So, what is significant about this? Also, the first co educational residence. How many of you who were going to school in the 60s, perhaps even into the 70s, were in single sex dorms? I mean, can you imagine a co-educational living center in 1930? <laughs> Extraordinary. So I'll start off on the women's note for a second. One of its many, many distinguished alumni was John Kenneth Galbraith. Oh, Donna and I, Donna, by the way, is a former resident of I House, Wait, Donna, she lived at I House. Donna and I had the, the privilege of welcoming and helping to, him to rediscover the whole Bay Area. At any rate, 
John, John Kenneth Galbraith lived at Iron House during Prohibition, the early 30s, 31, 32, I think it was. <clears throat> and so in those days, they used to check the men's backpacks, or whatever their sacks were, for alcohol. It was illegal. Right? They didn't check the women's backs. <laughs> <laughs> they have this idea, oh, the women, oh, you know, pure, pristine, no, no, no. <laughs> So John Kenneth Galbraith, you know, who's written several books, I'd have to go back to my library to find the exact title of the one in which he writes about this. But in essence, he talks about prohibition and alcohol issues at I House. And he said, you know, one day, one evening, uh, my friends and I were looking down into the heft, was today called the Heller Patio. It's the internal patio that you don't see from the street. And there was singing, wild singing going on. And there were several women, half naked, completely smashed from alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, that helped to break an important stereotype. And, and, uh, and alcohol has always been an issue through the decades. But the whole point of that was that he was breaking a stereotype. And here were women and men that were discovering things about each other by living together. So, again, just kind of focusing on the impact of the institution of first fraternities at Cal, later became integrated by former residents of I House. The Claremont Hotel, which used to hold segregated teas up until the early 50s, were integrated by residents of I House who went there and protested. There were restrictive covenants in the Berkeley Hills. The very first resident of color was a Chinese gentleman by the name of Milton Liang, who I, Don and I had the great privilege of knowing and meeting in the early 90s. He was a member of the board of directors. And his roommate, who was a law student, Bill Hessler, was it? Is that right? Was it Hessler? Hessler Bob, yeah. Right. Basically, as I understand the story, he purchased a house in the Berkeley Hills and Milton moved in. And he was the first one to break the restrictive covenants uh, in, in the Berkeley Hills. So, I mean, immediately you began to see these changes kind of seeping out through the influence of the house. Let me just give you a feeling of uh, the mood at the time. It's one thing for me to say, but here, December 1928, there was a little publication here in Berkeley called The Courier. A local Berkeley paper reports the Berkeley Improvement Association's adamant opposition to the creation of the house. The association was afraid that International House would attract darker-skinned individuals who were described as leprous spots. Oh. <laughs> as well as swarming Asiatics who would lower property values. But the anonymous writer of the article, Campanile Eyes, a different publication, disagreed. The author suggested that people of color would carry the learning of our university far and wide. They are an embryo, the new understanding between East and West of the future. And that's a whole other story about other distinguished alumni from around the world who came to great positions of prominence. Um, another, just another to give you the feeling of what was going on then. He was a gentleman uh, who lived in Berkeley and used to come to events at I House, but he didn't live there. But he was progressive for his time, and his father was adamantly against anybody who didn't look like a white person. You know? So this son said, I lived with my family in Berkeley, so I was never an I House resident. After its construction, our activities took place there. Of course, there were the Sunday evening dinners and programs and other meetings. I especially recall more than on one occasion with Roy Wilkin, Wilkins, many of you remember, mm -hmm. NAACP. I also recall my father saying there was something wrong with anyone who went out of his way to people who weren't his kind of people. Oh and that I flared. They are my kind of people, and there's something wrong with someone who goes out of his way to avoid people he doesn't know. That's what the son said to his father. Um, I don't want to miss some of these points. Ah, so miscegenation, right? And one of the other fears was, oh, these people who come from different backgrounds, ethnic racial backgrounds, and I know race, race is a, a difficult topic in terms of what is race, etc., etc., but I think you know what I mean. So people were afraid of interracial marriages. 
So here's an incredible story that is documented in uh, Alan Blaisdell's oral history. There was a Caucasian gentleman, not a resident of our house, who fell in love with a Japanese woman at our house. And they were, that, it got so serious they were engaged to be married. This was in the early 30s. And there was an uproar in the press. All you have to do is do a little search about this. And you'll see even the Japanese consul in San Francisco was upset about this. Remember, it was illegal. This was, oh my God, they're sleeping together. They're probably sleeping together right now. <laughs> so, so, so the other thing is, Alan Blaisdell wanted to protect them. And so he put them in the back of his car. He writes about this in his oral history. And, you know, I don't think he exaggerated from what I know about him. And he had to put a blanket over them so nobody would stop them. And he drove them down to the bay, to the marina, where they picked up a boat to get to the ocean liner that would take them to Paris. When this came to be, came to light, Alan Blaisdell was threatened. People were threatening to kill him. To kill him. And so, for six months, according to his oral history, uh, he had to enter the back door of my house because of fear that, because of what he had done, he was going to be disposed of. In any case, he was, and I suspect he will always be, the longest serving executive director of International House. And let's talk a little bit about some of its significant alumni. How many of you know the name Emmett Rice? You know, okay? And that may be because, if I'm not mistaken, did your parents not live there during that time? Yes, I, I wrote the book about my house. Okay, and, and uh, I recommend that you speak, which you may have to say a few words about that book, about the late 40s and early 50s in a few minutes. So basically, Emmett Rice, how many of you have never heard of him? Okay, good. That's why I'm here. <laughs> how many of you have heard of Susan Rice? Susan Rice. Okay, former ambassador to the United Nations, a national security advisor to Barack Obama, and actually to Joe Biden, I think, later on. Certainly, she worked on domestic policy with Joe, Joe Biden, national security advisor to Barack Obama. Emmett Rice was her father. Emmett Rice was a Tuskegee Airman. Now, anybody here do not know who the Tuskegee Airman is? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> of course, most people, many people in this country still don't know that. Who integrated the fire department in Berkeley? And Rice. He got his PhD in economics at Cal. He went on, I believe, to become a professor at Cornell about my memory service. And he became the second African American member of the Federal Reserve under Jimmy Carter. Yeah, it was a Jimmy Carter appointment, and ironically, he served with Volcker. What was Volcker's first name again? Paul, Paul Volcker, ironically, who became chairman of the board of the International House in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Emmett Rice. Okay, so let's take the second person, and again, we can go on and on about each of these persons' uh, contributions over time. Dr. Wendell Lipscomb. Did anybody here in this audience know Dr. Wendell Lipscomb? Okay. <laughs> So Dr. Lipscomb was on the I House board. He's no longer with us. He was also a Tuskegee Airman. He was the first black doctor at Kaiser. I think he graduated third or fourth in his class at UCSF. He lived at I House. This was after being a Tuskegee Airman, right? By the way, he taught Tuskegee Airmen. He was not only an airman himself. He started flying at the age of 16. How do I know this? Don and I became friends with Wendell over the years. Uh, and so, basically, here's this man who becomes the first black doctor at Kaiser, and they didn't know that they were hiring a black person because they didn't have photos in that day when you did have papers. So, of course, when he arrived, you know, given the mentality of the time, people were shocked, and they looked for every possible reason to fire him. And eventually, they did. But before that happened, he delivered many babies at Kaiser. And I know from other people in his family that many of the people who gave birth with his assistants named their children Wendell. <laughs> so 
having been fired from Kaiser, he decided, well, I'm going to become a psychiatrist. <laughs> and he went out to get his PhD at, I think, the University of Michigan. And then came back to, to run uh, drug and alcohol centers here in the United States. He headed the drug and alcohol center up in Ukiah and was a psychiatrist here in, in Berkeley until he passed, actually. Um, the other thing is, when he retired, he used to bring Tuskegee Airmen to International House when we'd have special events there, because the students had no idea. They were black pilots that nobody knew about that they had to keep quiet for so, such a long time that weren't even recognized by our country until the late 90s. So Wendell would bring his fellow uh, Tuskegee Airmen to talk about their experiences in the Second World War. Why is this all so important? The military was integrated in, what is it, 1948? Do I have that right? So obviously many members of the military, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Tuskegee Airmen were significant in pushing that integration. So just now to put a cap on this again, Wendell has a huge story, but let me, I think this is something that really inspired us. Uh, Donna wrote a, a piece about, what was San Francisco Magazine, the piece you wrote about Wendell? So basically, he helped to start something called the Oakland Flight Academy. Anybody here remember what that was? The Tuskegee Airmen alumni, the Tuskegee Airmen, recruited at-risk kids from Oakland and taught them how to fly. Uh, taught them how to fly. And many of them are pilots today. So I don't think the Summer Academy in Oakland exists anymore, but it may have been moved to another part of the United States. But this was one of many, many significant contributions. I once asked Wendell, I said, what was it like living in our house then? I mean, there were other black students then. What was it like? And he was very cryptic. He would say one or two things, and you would get a huge sense of meaning from him. He said, well, there was one Indian gentleman who kind of said to me, Wendell, I just didn't know. I didn't know. Okay. So now let's move on to how we do it. Okay. Uh, Pauli Murray. How many of you have heard of Pauli Murray? Wow. Okay, Pauli Murray. Amazing story. She, African American woman. She lived at I House 1944 to 5 when the I House was occupied by the Navy. And the, ironically, the residents of I House, the spirit carried on, they lived in the fraternities. Because I House was occupied by the Navy from 43 to 46. So, uh, Holly Murray was the only female, not the only black female, the only female at the law school in Berkeley. The only one, okay? Uh, and she was a lesbian. <laughs> there was a documentary done about her last year on PBS. If it comes back, I encourage you to watch it. Uh, Pauli Murray then went on to get her doctorate. I think she was the first woman to get a doctorate at Yale. Okay? And ironically, two or three years ago, a, a building at, at the Yale camp, on the Yale campus that was named after a, a slave owner, they took the name away, that building is now named after Paul Murray. So Pauli Murray, this is this is what really kind of blew. I mean, I knew a little bit about Pauli Murray. She was the very first black pres Presbyterian minister in the United States. And then I started to read more about her. She became close friends with Thurgood Marshall. Whose legal papers do you think were responsible for Brown the Board of Education? Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray. They should be kept friends with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <laughs> whose legal papers were influential in securing the Equal Protection Act. Holly Murray. So if you dig a little bit deeper, and you deep, she wrote many books, you know, who started the National Organization of Women? Who knows? No. I'll get to the second. We're building to the climax. Most people think, partially true, Betty Friedan. Who was the co-founder? Betty Friedan. <laughs> if nothing else happens today, what will be about Pauli Murray? Her story has to be told and retold and retold. Okay, so let me pause for a second. Janine, would you like to say a few words about the book you produced about the, the, the late uh, 
40s and early 50s was called the golden age of international housing. Um, yes, I, uh, so um, some of these people you're talking about, and their guys, Linda Lipskin, um, Milt Leong, who married Wen Yen Chow, and her twin sister um, married a Caucasian man. So they, that there was already, I don't know what year that was, and that was the question I had. Did they have problems? But, um, so some of, yeah, a lot of these people you're talking about were in the post-World War II era. Uh, and I, in that year, I can't remember person, we together collected the stories of those people, because it was really extraordinary time. People coming from concentration camps, most of the men had been in the war, some of the women had been in the service. Uh, so, there are a couple of copies here. Unfortunately, there are very few left, so I can't really offer them for sale, but it's available on the IHOS website. Yes, There's, it a, copy is. Can There's a digital version on the IHOS website. Yeah. So you can hear sort of what it's like. There's a lot of, a lot of inter ethnic, interracial marriages that lasted. There were some. They the golden age of Ayahuasca. They call themselves the golden age. Shanti Shanti area. So they call themselves the golden age. Which some following generations like it was the golden age for us too. But, um, somehow they coined that term first. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so before I, I, I come now to some very significant Chinese alumni. Let me also not fail to mention what happened in Pearl Harbor. So Pearl Harbor, the attack of Pearl Harbor was, of course, uh, sent shockwaves around the world, and certainly here on the West Coast, particularly because of the threat of the, the threat and the actual implementation of the Japanese internment. But a, a gentleman who also went to the house, how many of you remember a man by the name of Harold Gilliam, who was a, uh, a, uh, a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, his, his, his whole thrust was the environment. And actually his son later came to, to work at our house. So this is what Harold Gilliam wrote during that time. Harold said, I remember watching the lights go out all over the Bay Area during air raid blackouts. There we were, Americans, Japanese, Germans, Europeans, Asians, Africans, students whose homelands were on both sides of the war, literally and figuratively holding hands in friendship as the candles flickered and the news flashes of fighting came in from Honolulu, from Manila, from Singapore, from London. Now I should say to, again, another reason to honor Alan Blaisdell, you know, he, like all of these executive directors, including yours truly, you know, have our strengths and our weaknesses. But one of the very noteworthy things he did, he was one of the few people in the state of California who spelt, spoke out against the Japanese internment. Alan Blaisdell. And he made sure that as many of the Japanese residents as possible that he could send back east to the International House of Chicago, another Rockefeller house created in 1934, and to the New York house. So there were some he was actually got away from the West Coast. Um, and many years later, many years later, of course, many of those uh, former uh, Japanese residents came to honor him, uh, and they speak about him with great gratitude. So that was an important part of this. Okay, a little transition now, because we are now in the Berkeley Historical Society time of honoring the Chinese in Berkeley. So, how many of you saw the film Oppenheimer? Okay. <laughs> Are you ready for the transition? <laughs> for a long time, we created back in the early 90s a Hall of History that kind of documented the famous people who lived there, the impacts, etc. Et so Donald Beasley. Mr. Oppenheimer used to eat at I House. <laughs> you didn't know that, right? Okay, that's a nice little anecdote. So I knew that, and when the movie came out, I decided to revisit the Hall of History, went back into the house, and there he was, sitting at the table, it was probably in the auditorium, eating around the table, and sitting right next to him was a woman of Asian descent. I didn't exactly know who it was at the time, 
But I knew at the time that there was a very famous physicist, female from China. Now forgive me if I don't pronounce the name correct. Chong Chen Wu. Now, if there's anything I miss here, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot, please add. She was an Irishman. And she got a PhD at Cal. And then she went on to work on the Manhattan Project. For which she, like Oppenheimer, as for those of you who are aware of this, had you know divided feelings about this is a very dangerous weapon. But she was working on it. And then she went on and uh, was a scholar at Columbia University until she passed actually in the 80s. And there are there are books about her. Now she is referred to as the first woman of nuclear physics. If you read about her, you'll see. Secondly, the Chinese matter theory. Maybe they should have said that the French, <laughs> the French Chen Wu. At any rate, uh, many people, as if you begin to read more about her, she worked uh, tirelessly on nuclear fission uh, items, as far as I know. And many people have said, won many awards. Not to, I'm not saying here that she didn't get recognized. But many people have said, had she not been a woman, she would have gotten the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. That you see in many uh, discussions about her. So, did you want to add anything to that? I'm sure I'm missing something right now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Anyone else who may know a little bit about her? So, she will. Uh, so, go ahead. I think she has had special affairs to, to work in the Hatton Project in terms of Chinese national. That's right. That's right. But also, there was the, the whole question of uh, the fact that she, you know, the, the Chinese were obviously fighting also against the Japanese. So that was kind of part of the, the equation. And there was in 2021, there was a forever United States postal stamp made with her picture on it. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. I have. <laughs> I mean, this is what happens when you bring all these people together. They discover each other's talents, humanity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look, this is a slight digression. Cal had 15, 16, 17 Nobel laureates, right? Something like that. I don't know if it's still the, the, the largest number. Half of them lived in our house. Half of them. So think about this. You know, 20, 30,000 now, about 40,000 students. I house houses anywhere between 500 and 600 students, depending on the year, the decade. Half of the Nobel laureates live the I house. I am convinced that's because these people had a curiosity that went beyond their academic discipline. They wanted, they wanted to know. They wanted to experience. Um, second person I'd like to talk about. Thanks to your invitation, I started to do research about some of the Chinese alumni that I didn't know about or I knew too little about. Lived at I House in 1940. He was the first PhD Chinese student at Stanford Law School. School first. He was the first Chinese Deputy Attorney General in the state of California. And he was the first sitting judge, Chinese sitting judge, in the United States of America. Okay. Then we're going to talk a little bit about somebody who was featured uh, in the history exhibit here, Maggie G. Now, some of you know about Maggie G. How many of you know about Maggie G? Okay. She lived at I House after some of her heroic deeds in 1951, I believe. And there's a, a big uh, uh, area uh, dedicated to her in the, in the exhibit. She was an Air Force pilot in the Second World War. Now, women. You know, we're, getting, we're making progress, but women were not permitted to fly in combat. What was unusual about Maggie G? Maggie G was, yes, she flew planes. And yes, she was flying to support the troops in the war, but not as a you know, war dropping bomb. But the other thing that really caught my eye is that she taught many men to fly planes, so even though she wasn't allowed to fly a plane herself, Maggie G. And as some of you know, there have been discussions about naming the Oakland Airport after Maggie. Wow. Want to know more about Maggie G? It's in the exhibit. 
Now I'd like to introduce you to uh, a former resident who lived in my house during the night. And through her, I learned, and now you will learn, something about her father. Heather Chad, 1991. Come on, Heather. It's Heather is a graphic designer, graphic designer, a ceramicist, works in the tech world, and has two teenage daughters. And lived at our house. Now, I performed her wedding. <laughs> So, yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about my parents because they have been two main influences in my life. I mean, well, I'm here now because of them, but there's more to it. So, my mom um, was actually on the board of directors at Rising Bob Architecture during a couple years. Yeah. Um, and so, our connection with my parents is, is very close. And, as he mentioned, he married my husband and I 20 years ago. So. Um, so my mom, she was born in San Francisco, China in 1928. And for many girls of that generation, college was not part of the plan. And that was, you know, after high, after high school, boys would go to college if they can get in, and girls would find a job. And that was no different in my grandparents' home. But my mom's older brother went to Cal, and after he graduated, he realized that you know things could be different for women. And he convinced my grandfather to send my mom to college. And and so with my support, financially and emotionally. My mom went to Cal. After she graduated, she she graduated with a, a degree in architecture. She went to San, she came back to San Francisco, and she worked in a couple different firms. And she was the only female architect draftsperson in two of the different firms she, she worked in. And you know there were firms from like there were small firms, but the only female. It was kind of crazy, and she worked through her 20s, and then in when, late in the 20s, she married my father. So my dad, he received a master's of architecture from Cal as well in 1951. And he went to work on one of the, at one of the largest rooms in the nation at that time, Warner King and Associates in San Francisco. So his unique talent and creative skills were soon recognized and he was rapidly promoted to chief designer in the practice. And during his tenure, he, he designed major buildings, and including some buildings on the East Berkeley campus in Stanford. And um, his final project with the firm was the Hawaii State Capitol, which received a National American Institute of Architects Design Award. And the AIA Award is like receiving an Oscar in the architecture So he, after that, he went on to form his own company with a partner, and during the 50 years of his practicing, he, um, he did many different projects, including colleges, campuses, um, housing projects, hospitality, across five different continents. And, you know, when I see old pictures of my dad's work meetings in the 50s and 60s, black and white pictures, he's the only person of color amongst a table of Caucasian people. And it was actually reassuring for me because it, it meant that his talent came through and he was able to advance and become the head designer even during the time where people color, both were racial divides and barriers. So when he had his own firm, he, he did many projects, and among them were, like, he designed dozens of trigger banks and Benihana's and Berkeley's very young Shape and Peace. Shape and Peace, folks, next time you go there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you these things because my parents taught me two things major 
The first one is that they taught me that your occupation could be more than just a job. If you're lucky and determined, your occupation could be your passion as well. And architecture was not just a job for my parents, it was a lifelong passion. And I have four brothers and one sister. Five of us are in the design field. Mm -hmm. And one of us, of course, is a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that is his passion. <laughs> and the second thing they taught me was breaking barriers is not easy. And we cannot do it alone. So if it were not for the support of my uncle, my mom would have had a very different life, and I wouldn't have been here today. And it's a good reminder for me that it's okay to seek support and accept help from others. And that even though sometimes I may feel like I'm living in, all, in an island all by myself, I'm not. There's other people around that I can ask for help if I wish. And in turn, I can also give support to others and build stronger ties with my friends, family, and just people that come into my life and just build community. And I'm happy, I'm happy person when I do that. Man Chan, Man Chan introduced me to well, it was Milton Leon, I spoke about earlier, who wrote the Descriptive Covenants in the Berkeley Hills, introduced me to Lan Chang. And they, in turn, introduced me to Chinese cuisine that I never even imagined. <laughs> a gorgeous Chinese cuisine. Um, and by the way, Milton himself, Lan Chang, like they told me about, worked with T.Y. Lin, who's also featured in the exhibit, who was a very significant structural engineer here in Berkeley in the, I guess it was the 40s and 50s. And so Milton worked with him. And um, it just was a, another one of the blessings that Don and I had received through, through the people at, at I House. I also want to say that Lund also was an extremely modest person. He wouldn't talk about these things. Uh, he also volunteered to fight, and he did fight in the Second World War in the United States. And I believe he was also involved in code breaking. He was doing code breaking in the United States. So let me, allowing now for some questions, I just want to end with what I thought was, you know, as you can imagine, hundreds, thousands of stories that John and I have experienced through the house over the years. And I thought this one, this one in particular, would be one that might be appropriate to end this talk on. <clears throat> Many international and U.S. American residents have had limited or no contact with African Americans until they live in International House Berkeley. When Jeffrey, an African American from Detroit, opened the door to his room, his new roommate from Hong Kong looked shaken and upset. Despair filled my soul, he recalled. At first I thought I want out, said this. Um, Chinese food. But then I realized, why would a German, Argentinian, or Canadian, or someone from my own country look at me differently? For the first few weeks, we barely talked. Then, after I unpacked several Chinese language books, he asked why. When I answered in Mandarin, he was shocked. We talked until dawn. It led to many cross-cultural talks between us covering Chinese customs, traveling, romance, and African-American cultures. Our cross-cultural chats made us aware of our commonalities and differences. Right before Christmas vacation, he asked, with all the sincerity, sincerity of a father's fear of losing a son, if I continue being his roommate, Mm -hmm. into the next year. That, you know, for me and Donna, in some, in some ways, just kind of epitomizes and summarizes the magic of what happens when you actually spend time with people, eating with them, learning with them, doing things with them, and getting beyond those surface differences and getting to the heart of humanity. Okay.